So um, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Dr. Levin and Dr. Akit um, from Ovid Therapeutics. And I'm just looking to see there. They are here. They come. Um, so we're going to skip that coffee break, and I, I want to make sure we get to the nitty-gritty of the exciting details that um, you are all here for. And I think coffee is a lot less important since we're running behind. Um, so uh, Dr. Levin is the CEO and the chairman of Ovid Therapeutics, and he comes to us from a very um, great history in the um, biotherapeutics and pharmaceutical industry. So he has a vast amount of experience. Um, and they have committed about three years ago to Angelman syndrome, and they have done nothing less than commit. So um, they have been a real great leader in the Angelman clinical trial um, agenda, and they really have helped bring our entire agenda and disease forward and have created a real excitement in the world of therapeutics. So we are so grateful to them. Um, Dr. Rakit is the chief medical officer and the chief portfolio officer for Ovid Therapeutics. Um, and he also is a MD. Um, and I believe he has like two MBAs, a dual MBA. I don't even know what that means, but that sounds like he has a lot of letters after his name. Um, but ultimately, he um, is a pediatric cardiologist. So he also understands children. He understands therapeutics, and he understands what it means to bring therapeutics to children. So we really are blessed to have both of them in our world, and we're excited to have them present to us today. Would you prefer this one? Yeah. Amit, come up. No, no, give me support, please. Um, I hate to stand in front of you before your coffee, or not. I've even avoided having the coffee. I'm terribly sorry about that. But um, actually, I haven't had mine either. So we've got a little time here. What I'd like to do is just to uh, do two or three things that will be helpful. Number one, we want to tell you exactly what we're doing and how we're trying to help you and the families. Amit's going to walk through a presentation on that. I don't have a presentation. I'd like to take a few minutes before that to tell those of you who haven't heard uh, about Ovid, a few words about Ovid. Not very much, enough so that you won't go to sleep, I promise you. But by a show of hands, I, this is an enormous crowd, Alison. Uh, I can't tell you what an extraordinary change this is from three, four years ago when uh, looking out at this group, you could be forgiven for seeing that this was just a really energetic group of families. But what I see in front of me now is something totally different. It is actually a critical mass. It is a validation of everything that you've been trying to do as families and as participants in trying to crack the code to find medicines here. So let me uh, first of all admit something. I knew nothing about Angelman's disorder five years ago. It was on a list of rare disorders that, yes, we had to tackle. And yes, there was some interesting science, and I can tell you that every single marketing person in the pharmaceutical companies, Bristol Myers Group, Novartis, Roche, others, sorry, Megan, with, forgive me, they all said, there is no market. What they didn't ask was, is there a medicine? Megan, you'd agree. Tell me what the marketing guys really do say. There is no market. What a disgraceful thing. Absolutely unacceptable. Completely unreal and frankly un something that made me leave large pharmaceutical companies. And so when I left it, it was very simple. It was to devote myself to what I believe is the one thing that matters and that is the patient, the families and solving for medicines. So little of it, and it is little, we're only 40 people, we're based in New York, we have no fancy offices, we're in a WeWork. If you come there, have a look at us. Yeah, I don't know if any of you know what a WeWork is. Yes, I have a nice suit, I'm sorry about that, but that's in respect for you. But the reality is, we all live in a big room like this. And we work day by day on one thing and one thing only, and that is how do we solve problems for patients. And so we've chosen rare disorders of the brain as an area that we think must be solved. And number one amongst that is Angelman. And there's a reason for that. One, we think the need is immense. We've always believed that. I've, as I began to learn about it as a physician, and I went to visit families, and I don't know if Becky's here. Is Becky here? No, Becky's not here. Hello, Becky, wherever you are. 
I learned a lot about what it means to be a, a mother of a child. I learned a lot of what it meant to be a father of a child. I learned a lot of what it meant to be a brother of a child and a sister of a child who has angelments. And so I decided that I was going to change my life and devote it utterly to this. So the little ship of it set sail with two people in a room three and a half years ago. And fast forward with your help, with the incredible support of people just urging us and saying, we really need this, we really want this, it will help us. And then when Becky came with us to the FDA to talk about what it meant to make a difference, that her child could have a single change in one sign language, one American sign language would make a huge difference. I threw every concept I had out of the window about what it made to make a difference. We will do everything we can to make a difference. This year has been a seminal year for us. Last year I stood in front of you and said, gee, we're going to start the STAR trial. Okay, big heavy lifting. have to confess that the 40 people under Amit, tomorrow where are you, somewhere out here? Yes, I know you're somewhere at the back, don't hide. And the team have actually done a huge job in getting that trial running. And yes, initially it was only for adults, but what was critical, what was critical, our first patient that's not true. The first Angelman adult came into the trial in February. Since that time, we devoted ourselves specifically to asking the question, how do we get to younger ages? So as you know, we spent a tremendous amount of time doing the one thing that I regard as essential, is ensuring that the medicines we give to the children and younger ages, or any age for that matter, are safe. A medicine that I would take, I would give to my child. There was no way that I was going to risk any child anywhere that, for Ovid's sake of developing a medicine. We're not going to do that. So we went off to Germany, and we tested our drugs, first of all, in animals. So we now know, and we're delighted to say, that pediatric animal safety studies have been done, completed. So that's good news. And then, with the help of the community, both Fragile X and Angelman's, we conducted a very strategic, what's called a phase one PK trial. That trial was designed to ask only a very straightforward question, but a very sophisticated question. If you give the medicine that we're giving to adults, to adolescents, will you see the same behavior of the drug in the blood of those children and adolescents? And the answer is yes. And that triggered something quite fundamental that triggered the ability for us now to take uh, adolescents down to the age of 13 into the trial. Now, I know it takes slow time, but I ask your forgiveness on that, and I ask your patience, because what we're trying to do here is an incredibly rigorous trial, one which we have great faith in the, uh, in the way that the mechanisms that we've seen in animals and the mechanisms we've seen in cells and the... You know, to be honest, I hope it'll be... Everything I've seen scientifically leads me to believe we have a really very important medicine here. However, that, doesn't, that is not sufficient for us not to prove that it's safe and to prove that in actual fact we can take it down to younger ages. Now we can do that. So as of last week, Amit took the trial and opened it up now to... We're waiting for IRB approval, but we will be able to admit... Uh, adolescents over the age of 13 into the trial, which is a great progress for us. At the end of the day... <laughs> at the end of the day, what's really important, though, is to look at the entire community, from birth all the way through to those who have... their parents have died and they're in institutions. It is our goal to be able to provide medicines to that entire community. So we start with OV101. And I can't promise you a transformative medicine, okay? In my life, I have developed many medicines. There's only one or two that I know are utterly, completely transformative. And those are the ones that have utterly cured a disease. And the transformative measure, the, the measure of a transformation is that when you take the medicine away, there's no longer a disease. That's the only measure. When you take the medicine away, you've no longer got a disease. I can't promise you that. 
I can promise you one thing, that if our medicine works, it'll work to improve the lives of all of those age groups. So step number one this year was this huge effort on developing OV101. We're well advanced, the MIT will update you fully on that, and any questions you have on it, please. But I also want to tell you about something else, and that is the thinking behind Ovid. You won't know very much about us, we're one of thousands of little companies out there in the world, but we are devoted utterly and completely to the problem that your children and your families have. And in that regard, we, uh, we did a couple things. Number one, we, uh, we looked at the problems that the families were facing. We looked at the problems the children were facing. We understood what our medicine might do. And the one thing it couldn't do was it couldn't affect epilepsy. It's not, it's not designed to do that. It's a drug which works differently. So as we thought about what we learned about from the patients, we set about two years ago, actually, because a lot of the work was done preparatory, thinking through what would we need to help fundamentally the lives of people. So we thought about epilepsy, and we went out and we looked at all of the different medicines out there in the world uh, that might be epileptic. And yes, there's some very good ones still. We all know that. And, but we discovered in Takeda a molecule, a completely novel molecule, a molecule called 935, which actually, like all big companies, there was a debate ongoing inside it. There were marketing people saying, no, this should be for Alzheimer's, no, this should be for, for, di for schizophrenia, no, this should be for depression. But as we looked at it, and we looked at it again, and we looked at it again, and again, and again, we then started asking a different question. Well, hang on a second, have you got this right? And because of the relationship with Takeda, which is a very wonderful, large Japanese company, and led the research there led by a tremendously imaginative R&D leader called Andy Plum. Andy said, come in and visit us. Give us ideas. Think about it. And we laid out, step by step by step, why this particular medicine actually would be better served in epilepsy. And they thought about it. And after a while, um, they said, OK, well, we're not giving it to you. <laughs> so OK, fair enough. What does that mean? They said, well, this is, our, this is one of our treasures. It's one of the best molecules we have in the, in the system. I said, OK. Well, one thing you should know about Ovid. Ovid, we put our own money, not anybody else's, not some. Ovid was started with our money, not anybody else. We put our money on this. We did the same thing there. We said, OK, we want to buy 50% of this, but under one condition, one condition, that our team develops it, and that it's developed for orphan disorders, and it's developed for neurological orphan disorders, and it's developed for neurological epileptic disorders. And amazingly, they said, OK. So what you have now, think about, think about the logic behind this. We know with OV101, we're looking at movement, sleep, and several other behavioral issues. We are not addressing with that epilepsy. We will certainly monitor it in the trial, but we're not addressing it. Now, on the other hand, we have secured what I believe is one of the most novel, innovative, new approaches to epilepsy. And you say, well, you're going off on a different tangent. Not at all. It's all integrated. The whole focus of this company is how can we address all the different problems that you might face in a way which is completely different from other companies, in a way that our whole mindset every day says, what does somebody with Angelman's experience, what do the families experience, how can we affect it? So yes, we're running trials in epileptic encephalopathies. These are these epilepsies which are terrible. They, the, the children deteriorate. But the goal behind it is not just to help them. That's the quickest route we can get it to uh, patients. That's how the FDA guides us. But the goal there is completely clear. If we have a medicine that we can provide for that group, we can also immediately provide it for the Angelman group. And that's what the goal is. The goal is you look at this, you look at the individual, you don't look at what the business is. You ask the question, what problems can I solve practically today, tomorrow, and in the short term? So as you think about Ovid, think about us. Yes, it's a, the intergalactic headquarters of Ovid has only got 40 of us. 
we are helped out, we are leveraged by many different people. We work with CROs, we work with people outside, work with researchers in Holland, researchers in South America and elsewhere, and we carefully think through what will be the therapies that we can make a difference on. Then coming up behind that, if you think about how we think about our programs, each time we think about how we've solved for now and maybe the next couple years, we are starting to look very carefully at all these incredible areas that you have heard about. Megan just described a beautiful set of work that they're doing in Roche, absolutely lovely. There's other companies like Agilis who's doing really interesting work. There's, um, there's the work that's being done on gene therapy, other types of gene therapy. All this is fantastic. So as we raise our eyes from the day-to-day -day practical uh, work, yes, you may think about us and listen to this accent. I, I actually prefer baseball to, to cricket. So I look at this as, you know, I like, uh, I like getting a... I don't necessarily have to have a home run, but I don't mind a base hit. I want a base hit, I get to second base, get to third base, and I will get the home run. And that is exactly the way we think. We don't exaggerate. We are now in the business of looking to what are the next things that we need to bring into our pipeline. So how do we do that? Well, we do that by talking to all of the great companies out there. We want to collaborate with every single one of them. Our view is that we, may, we are good at what we do, but if we work together, we'll be better at what we do. And that's always been the philosophy I have. There's only one thing that matters, bring the right therapies to everybody that needs them. So with that in mind, we, I, don't, I don't want to sort of predict the future. Probably I'll get in trouble for doing that because I'll probably be wrong, but on the other hand, I'll get in trouble just for predicting. Uh, we will be looking at interesting new genetic therapies. We will be looking at new biological therapies. And at the right time, when we feel comfortable that there is something that we can really make a difference with it, we'll definitely be there in exactly the same way that we got in with OV101-935. And, you know, somebody asked me a little back at the back of the audience, said, well, you took your company public. This is, isn't this all about money? The answer is no. Um, this is for us getting going public. We did this year. There was another big event. It took a huge amount of my time. I can't say it was very gratifying. Uh, I was here in Chicago and running around talking to fund managers who said to me, what's Angelman's disease? Oh, we've never heard of that. And why is it important? And oh, we don't really believe you. True. True. We don't believe you. It can't be that important. What? 5,000, 6,000 people, families. I said, wait a second, stop that nonsense. And yes, they financed us. And what happened was the bankers wanted to celebrate. And I said, we're not going to celebrate. Every single dollar that you have created for us is going to the patients. And they said, well, we need to have a big party. And I said, we're not going to have a big party. So they kept on beating on me. And so finally I said, OK, how much money are you going to spend on the party? They said, oh, we're going to spend $10,000. I said, well, that's a researcher. That's a patient. That's hundreds of patients of trips. So they said, so I went to the chairman of one of the companies that was financing us. And I said, here's what you're going to do. You're going to donate that money. You're going to donate it to a special organization that takes patients from, who can't afford to go to clinical trial sites. That's where you're going to do that to. So I understand that <laughs> it's the first time these bankers have ever done that. <laughs> so, so I want to turn to something else. So look, I, I talked to you about banking. Amit's going to talk to you about the trial. Uh, I want you to know that we are definitely in this with you. There's another side to what I do, which is important. Today, um, Tax reform is, on, is in the, on CNN and Fox News and Lord knows where else. But it affects you and us. Because in that current confirmation of the tax reform bill is something quite profound. For the first time, they're taking away the orphan drug, orphan drug tax rebates. Now, this is incredibly important. I know it's an arcane, tiny little thing because you and I are probably thinking about when these guys get finished with this bill, what's it going to mean for me at the end of the week? That's what really matters. 
But for the research in orphan drug diseases, that tax bill could be devastating. And the most important thing for you to think about is if, the, if you have a chance to go back and just read about this, I would urge you to do that because a little voice of a little company means nothing. Your voice is incredibly powerful. Your voice is something that can make a difference in this. Getting people to invest in uh, all, all sorts of therapies that could possibly make a difference is incredibly important. And I, I'd like to urge those of you who are here in the room and those who are listening to not to be afraid, because frankly, please don't be afraid. Approach your legislators, ask them about the orphan drug tax credit, because it is the one thing that has helped stimulate an enormous amount of research so that investors should stop asking the question, what's Angelman's? It should be top of their mind. That's where they need to be. So, uh, Amit's got much more interesting things to talk about than, that, than me. Uh, I will please ask him to do that, and, but I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to today. I'm, I want to thank you again, Alison, for a, just a superb, superb uh, day. It's going to be so interesting. And I really would looking forward to all the other companies who are coming, all, talking to many of the families, many of the parents, if you're here, and there's several of you, I know you challenge me all the time, which is fun. Uh, but please, ask us the questions you have. So over with that, Amit. So how much time do I have? Um, probably about 10 minutes, just under 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Okay, great. I will go quickly. Uh, 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 thanks, Allison, and thanks, everybody. Uh, great to see many of you again. It's been about a year since we met, but uh, definitely the room has grown. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I know many of you here because of your involvement uh, with either, either with our clinical trial program or um, through the year we've met each other. Um, I owe, I know, the Madison, Wisconsin group a visit because I said that last year, so I'm just, I still haven't forgotten. Um, but uh, I'm uh, the chief medical officer at Ovid Therapeutics. I'm also a pediatric cardiologist uh, in the past when I was at Boston Children's Hospital. So I've been with the rare diseases and pediatric community for a long time. Uh, and so the passion that we bring really to Ovid is thinking about how we can make a difference for children and um, those affected, uh, children and adults, those affected with rare diseases, specifically rare neurological, neurological diseases. What I'm going to take you through a little bit, uh, I know many of you are uh, uh, aware of our clinical trial program. I'm going to take you through that in just a second. But a couple of things to say, because we went public this year, earlier this year, uh, this is, I have a disclaimer slide here. My disclaimer also is that I've seen the PDF version of this slide, but I haven't seen it with all the animations. So if there's something uh, funky with the animations, um, it's, uh, we'll I'll both be surprised together. Um, but before I jump into the clinical trial and the science behind of what we're doing at Ovid Therapeutics, I think the first thing I want to talk about is that our level of engagement. And so at Ovid, and I think Jeremy really articulated that well, we're all about people. It's, about, it's not about the, the um, conversation with the investor community or about the um, specifically a center, but what it comes down to are individuals, our individuals and families and caregivers who are affected by serious illnesses. And so at Ovid, we really aim to engage. And I'm just going to give you a few examples of what we do beyond just our clinical trial program and our science. Uh, we have actually engaged with several patient groups, patient advocacy organizations. It really started with FAST and the Angelman Syndrome Foundation. Uh, and beyond that, we've expanded our scope and working with several of these groups that you see here. Um, through the webinars that we actually hosted with FAST, uh, we were actually introduced and had a reach out from the Israeli Angelman Syndrome Foundation. And so that was a wonderful way that we actually were able to involve um, that team with the STARS program um, actually in uh, Tel Aviv. So our scope has been growing and mostly thanks to you. Uh, and I know I just saw Chloe earlier from the Australian uh, organization. We've been working very closely there and thinking about how we can then specifically 
expand our programs uh, internationally as well. So um, while we've started here, uh, FAST has been a uh, super supporter of us as well as being able to connect us to the global community around Angelman. So um, as we are looking at this, we're thinking about you um, and how we can then support moving forward. And it's all about communication as well, having uh, open lines of communication. We welcome questions. I welcome questions all the time. Uh, one way to do that is we're actually launching these podcasts, which you'll see soon coming out. Uh, we know there's lots of questions and unanswered questions that we can't always get through, um, uh, either through um, the, the community, or I'll hear about them from the, the moderators of your, your, uh, the private Facebook pages. Uh, but one way for us to do that, we thought about that, um, is to do more of these informational uh, educational sessions, uh, which we've done these live webinars before, but uh, now we're thinking about doing these podcasts. Uh, we've already have two ready to go, uh, which you'll be able to then listen to and hopefully we'll answer questions um, that we get and really in direct response to what we're hearing from the community. And this really allows us um, to communicate with you, to communicate with the global audience um, and really providing information um, to the communities and having a one, uh, having a two-way dialogue. Uh, so more to come about that. Um, uh, and also what we also like to do, and Allison and, and Chick were just at our offices a couple weeks ago, um, we have our, a monthly lunch and learns at our uh, headquarter offices in New York, and we invite people to come and just share their experiences. Uh, it's really important that it's not only the clinical uh, development group at Ovid who understands what it's like to have um, uh, a child or someone affected with a rare serious illnesses, but everybody comes to that, whether you're part of the business development team or the finance team or human resources, uh, we want to know and we want to understand how best to address um, uh, uh, the concerns that you have in actually your day-to-day -day life. So one of the ways we do that is these lunch and learn sessions that we actually invite people to come just have a, 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 some time and just spend with us to, to educate us. Um, one thing I'll just announce here is, uh, so last year we did, for those of you in the New York, New Jersey metro area, there is a science center called the Liberty Science Center, which is in Jersey City, New Jersey. Uh, we hosted a rare disease day um, at uh, that center. Um, rare disease day, as you know, is February 29th of each year, when there is a 29th, and if not, it's on the 28th. Um, this year, uh, this coming year in 2018, uh, we are hosting Rare Disease Day again on Saturday, uh, Sunday, March 4th. Uh, we heard from you that um, the weekdays is not the most convenient, so that's why this is on a weekend. It's the closest weekend date uh, to March, to Rare Disease Day. And so more information to follow, but for those of you in that area, we invite you to come uh, spend the day there with us. Um, uh, very similar to uh, what we did last year, it might be a little bit uh, larger, I think we're going to uh, expand that scope. So it was a very enjoyable, I think, educational experience for many people. Um, um, but just reach out to us if you need more information about that. And then this is the miracle flies. This Jeremy mentioned this about how we've supported beyond just um, uh, this is this is the the ten this is the ten thousand dollar that was we, that Jeremy talked about uh, that uh, our banking community uh, uh, contributed to this organization. Miracle flights uh, um, basically help transport people who are uh, through uh, um, air travel uh, through destinations for. Uh, um, health care uh, if they can't afford it and, or if they had different difficult means of getting there. So this is a quote, uh, for those of you who can't read it, um, uh, this is a quote from a, a family who was uh, uh, be able to participate. Um, we are a young Jewish family who was blessed with a special needs child. He was born with Angelman syndrome, a genetic condition that is a very severe disability. He is a six-year-old and has a very sweet personality. I'm turning to Miracle Flights because he needs to get to his specialist in St. Louis for our son. Thank you. Uh, we were able to support this family and able to get to their, uh, to, to their um, health care, and that's one of the things that we've been doing beyond just the science and uh, clinical trials that we do. So now I'm going to get a little bit more into the science. Just for those of you who are not familiar with our pipeline, I, Jeremy went through it. This here has a couple of our programs that are ongoing. So OV101 is our uh, program that is, STARS is one of them. This is a Delta Selective GABA receptor agonist. And the first trial that you see here is a STARS study, started initially in adults. And as you uh, just heard, we've expanded and opened up the 
um, trial to adolescents, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. Um, we also have a pediatric program that is uh, just slightly behind, and I'll mention a little bit about that as well uh, in just a few minutes. Our um, second arm of the OB-101 uh, program is in Fragile X syndrome, and we'll be also uh, announcing plans for our development in Fragile X, which will start in 2018. Um, the OB-935 is our collaboration with Takeda. This is uh, in the area of developmental and or epileptic encephalopathies. Um, and that program is currently ongoing. It's uh, an adult study that's ongoing that started um, um, uh, uh, this year um, and is uh, currently recruiting. So here are some of the accomplishments since the last time that we've actually spoke. So when we spoke last year, we were just starting up our STARS program. We were just initiating, and I'm very happy to say our first patient was in, um, uh, enrolled earlier this year, as you heard, uh, with adults. And uh, we've uh, then continued with a couple other things that were important for us to accomplish before moving into younger patient populations. So you see this bullet around completed preclinical juvenile toxicology studies. Those are studies in preclinical models, animal models, um, that ensure the safety uh, of moving into younger patient populations. OV-101 has a lot of data for um, adults. More than 4,000 adults have been treated with OV-101, but there was not any real significant data within the pediatric community, actually none, until we had generated it. And with your help, we were able to uh, move forward with the PK study, which is here and also been completed. OV-101 completed the PK trial in adolescents just recently. We announced that this late, earlier um, this week. Uh, and have now amended the STARS protocol so that we can include adolescents in that trial. Um, so top line results for STARS will be in 2018. We've told the um, external community it's the second half of 2018 and we'll further tell you more once we know about that. Um, just a quick mention of OB-935. Uh, this is the collaboration with Takeda. We've also started a study with uh, um, that program, a phase 1B2 study in adults. And again, we'll have top line results from that study in 2018 as well. And then we also plan to start with uh, pediatric and biomarker studies, um, which will come in the future. Uh, just a little bit more about OV-101. OV-101 um, uh, and Angelman syndrome are really based on the premise of tonic inhibition, and tonic inhibition being uh, uh, imbalanced in many conditions that affect the uh, central nervous system. Uh, Angelman syndrome and Fragile X being uh, two of those, but you can see there's a, uh, an abundance of areas where a tonic inhibition is, is affected. And what is tonic inhibition? Well, it's the ability to, in simple terms, the ability to distinguish kind of what's important signal for right now versus a signal that's not so important right now that you can consider noise. So as you're like concentrating on speakers uh, or up, up in front of you, um, you can hear what they're saying, you can process, and typically you would be able to, un, uh, to not, uh, to process the other signals around you without, uh, and consider them noise. So for example, um, the silent hum of the speakers. If you listen really carefully, there's a silent hum of the speakers, um, but you just have to listen for it. But uh, typically you wouldn't be uh, consciously uh, hearing that because you've processed that in your brain as noise, and so not important for right now. And so when you have imbalance in tonic inhibition, that's what causes an over uh, um, amplification of signals in your brain, and that's part of what's thought to uh, contribute to some of the symptoms in Angelman syndrome. Um, and when you look at preclinical models, um, the GABA pathway is very important in tonic inhibition. And so when we look at some of the different domains where this could be effective, we see that there is uh, um, uh, certain domains that we're interested in, both from neuronal excitability, motor, behavior, sleep, and cognition, which have correlates in the, the preclinical models, whether you have more seizures, um, uh, 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 disturbances of gait, um, anxiety, uh, disturbed rest uh, uh, or sleep cycles, as well as memory deficits. And so, as many of uh, you already know, uh, reduced GABA levels can lead to a loss of tonic inhibition in both Angelman syndrome and Fragile X models. And in the Angelman syndrome model, I'll just focus on a little bit, uh, given the, uh, the deficiency in UBE3A, well, this uh, deficiency leads to a lack of a protein that's very important in tagging 
other um, proteins for degradation at the cell wall. And what uh, the specific protein that we're talking about is the GAT1 transporter. This protein, when it's on the cell wall, basically reuptakes GABA from the extra, uh, what's called the extrasynaptic space. And that leads to a decrease in GABA. And so with that, it leads to the decrease in tonic inhibition and uh, uh, resulting symptoms. And so if we can actually restore some of that GABA that's supposed to be in the extrasynaptic space, we may potentially be able to restore some of the functionality of what that was supposed to do in the first place. And that's where OB101 comes in. This is an agonist, or basically it acts like GABA, which isn't there in that space. And by providing it um, uh, orally, actually, uh, is in our trials, um, we can actually restore, potentially restore that effect. It's um, uh, kind of receptor is, uh, uh, is very, the, the GABA molecule OV101 is very specific for uh, a part of this receptor, the delta subunit. Um, and at uh, low concentrations of GABA, uh, it's still very effective because it's a very potent and highly um, selective for the specific receptor. Um, and then again, if you look at the preclinical models here, uh, again, this is uh, in mouse models with a specific knockout of the UBE3A gene. Um, we can uh, mimic uh, conditions of uh, Angelman syndrome, which we see in the middle upper um, bubble there with elevated rates of neuronal firing. And then on the right side, you can restore the rate of neuronal firing uh, with the addition of OV101. And on the left side is the control. So you can see, at least in preclinical models and mouse models, it appears to have some effect moving forward. The lower slide shows that actually in clinical uh, models, and this is around restoring motor coordination, uh, we also see an effect with increased balance, which is shown in that lower left uh, graph, and then also um, looking at uh, reflexes on that lower right graph. Um, I know I'm going a little quickly here, just in the interest of time, but I think I wanted to look at and focus a little bit on the clinical trials. So this is where we are currently with the clinical trials. So the, I'm going to start on the left here, which is the phase one PK study, which has been completed. This study was uh, completed in 12 adoles adolescents aged 13 to 17 years of age, given a single dose um, of OV101. And it was really, help, it was really designed to uh, determine whether the PK profile, so how the compound actually acts in your body, once you swallow the pill, what does it do in terms of how it reaches to your blood and what level it reaches into your blood and how quickly it goes away, uh, is it comparable to adults? And it's important because um, uh, pediatrics, children, adolescents are not just little adults. They actually have very different metabolisms. They have very different um, growth patterns, as you know. Um, and so it's very important for us to understand whether it's comparable in adults. Um, if it's not comparable, then we have to do additional studies to see what the right dosing is. Well, it turns out that the PK profile of OB101 is similar across those age groups, 13 to 8, uh, uh, 17, uh, as adults. And so that's very encouraging for us because now we can actually incorporate and include adolescents into our STARS program. And so uh, what we've done is, and let me switch to the phase two study now on the, uh, the STARS trial. Um, this, initially, this uh, program was for 18 to 49-year-old patients, um, and now we've actually decreased the age to 13. Uh, we should expect um, that we will be enrolling in that age group over the next several weeks. I know we've already had some contact with, uh, the sites have had some contact with several uh, families who are interested. Uh, our first IRBs should be having their approvals for um, moving forward over the next couple of weeks. And so looking at um, how we're uh, tracking with this study, uh, it's really good to know, I'll mention to you, um, Thanks to you, we're more than two-thirds recruited into this study. So you can do the math. Um, it's uh, very uh, encouraging that all our sites are up. Uh, we have uh, two-thirds recruitment completed in the STAR study. And there are several uh, of you coming in over the next six weeks. Uh, so we're very close to completing enrollment for this study. So uh, what we'd like to do is have the ability to actually include some adolescents. Um, age groups um, in this population to see if there is a, a little bit of a difference between a younger age group versus an uh, a older age group. Uh, but if you look at the older age groups, uh, they tend to be on the younger side uh, that, that have been included. 
Um, this is a three-arm study, as you know. It's one of the first industry-sponsored placebo-controlled studies. Um, the placebo control, I know, has been something of a um, uh, question for why we needed a placebo control. It really helps us to determine uh, if there is an effect. Uh, that's why we have two active arms here. Uh, I will tell you there is uh, plans next year. We'll be talking a little bit more uh, of thinking about open label studies. Uh, and so uh, things that are coming forward for next year, um, uh, I'll get to you in just a second. But the primary endpoint here is for uh, incidence of adverse events. And the exploratory measures that we're looking around are looking at effect around efficacy. So similar to the, those uh, domains that I mentioned before in the preclinical models, whether they're motor function, behavior, sleep, um, those are all areas that we're looking at in, in this uh, study as well for, um, uh, for the STARS study. And um, the, in, in terms of uh, the, uh, the difficulty in actually completing the study, um, uh, the community has been very, very good about keeping that information to themselves. We've actually encouraged people not to post about the study and how the uh, assessments are done in their social media. Uh, but I think, you know, in terms of communicating the ease or difficulty, that's okay. Uh, because I would, I would tell you that, at least anecdotally, some of the comments I've heard is that it's not so difficult a study to do. It sounds daunting at first, but once you're actually in the study, it's not that difficult. Uh, there are only a couple of visits uh, that you really need to be in the clinic for. Most of it's at home. Um, so that's something to consider as you move forward. So what's going on with the study and the program for next year. Um, so we're heading into 2018. Uh, we are very interested, as Jeremy mentioned, in younger age groups and how we can get to younger uh, children affected by Angelman syndrome. Um, so one of the things that we are looking at is now that we have the adolescent information, is that gives us a big springing board to then go into younger patient populations, so specifically younger than 12. Um, there are specific regulatory guidances that we need to uh, fulfill in terms of dosing, in terms of understanding how the compound works in younger age groups. Like I mentioned, adolescents aren't like adults. Well, less than 12-year-olds aren't like adolescents. So how does that uh, affect the younger age groups? We are currently working on that. And so we'll be announcing plans for specific age groups, the ages two to five, two to four year old, we'll be announcing, as well as uh, programs in the ages five to 12 year olds, or five to 12 year olds, fairly soon. So just stay tuned for that um, in the early part of the year, we'll announce what we're doing with those age groups as well, so that all the age groups that we uh, uh, can cover uh, will be covered as, as soon as possible so that we can get into younger age groups and then affect uh, and hopefully uh, potentially see um, some activity that may be meaningful for all those, um, all those ages. So with that, I'm just going to just close out here by saying, look, uh, we're actually doing other things as well. Some of the communications that we've done around publications and congresses, uh, we've been invited internationally. One of our uh, 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 team members spoke at the Italian Angelman Syndrome Foundation, uh, which was uh, very well received. Uh, we published a review of the literature, uh, which is published in Orphanet Journal of Rare Diseases uh, this year. It gives you a review of Angelman Syndrome. Uh, we're also actively part of the ABOM meetings with Terry Joe, uh, and I think great work going on there. Uh, and then also we've also supported the ICD-10 ICD coding uh, for a new code for Angelman syndrome, which we hope that's going to move forward, which will be very important um, not only to you, but also for research as well. But also we just want to thank all of the community. Uh, it's really about uh, understanding and uh, communicating and educating, but also ultimately making a difference uh, for people living with Angelman syndrome. And thank you from all of us um, at the Ovid community. Really um, uh, see here, uh, really appreciate all the engagement you have had with us. So thank you very much. Oh, there it is. Um, so we have time for a couple questions. If um, you want to take maybe two, three minutes for questions from the audience. Are there any questions? One, two. Raise your hand high. Can you hear me? Yeah, OK. Sorry, I won't be as eloquent with this as I would like. I'm trying to get my head wrapped around what you're doing. Um, 
I'm trying to understand if the therapeutics you're working on will work in conjunction with the methods that we're looking to reinstore the UBE through A. Because mm -hmm. what I'm not clear on is if the deficiency in UBE 3A is linear in impacting the GABA receptors, you know, and not, there's nothing else going on, so that's like the tail end of what's happening, or is it a portion of what the UBE 3A deficiency might impact so that um, your therapeutics could work in one fashion and then UBE 3A restore could impact potentially other things equally or better? Does that Great. make sense? Yep, I, I think I get your question. So, um, so, I, uh, so uh, if you look at the spectrum of uh, potential therapeutic options now that are being dis uh, researched in instruments, right? So if you're looking at gene therapy, if you're looking at oligonucleotide therapy, if you're looking at small molecule therapy, so OV101 would fall into the small molecule compound. Uh, therapies. So I, I would say, you know, having multiple therapeutic options is, is good, right? Having potential multiple therapeutic options is good because not one therapy is going to be potentially right for each individual, right? So if you look at individuals, um, some may benefit from one versus another. Um, the things that we're looking at, so of course, you know, I'm very, very um, enthusiastic about gene therapy. I think it's wonderful. I think it is very, you know, um, the molecular understanding of disease is great. It's still not completely proven. There's been one gene therapy approved um, currently. Um, the questions still remain about what's the ultimate timing. Uh, when do you see the effect? Some people would argue you can do it whenever. So I worked on the SMA program at uh, Biogen, which recently launched at Spinraza. Um, there you can see, you know, res restoration of activity even if you give it after you know several months of, of life or so so um, but not all dis uh, disorders behave the same way so having multiple options available is good so I'm not sure and we'll see when the data comes out um, whether gene therapy needs to be given at birth in utero um, in or later in life what's going to happen there uh, but so um, until we know, I think the, that it's great that we have different avenues to approach and be able to kind of co coordinate. Um, and there may be that, yes, maybe there's a combination type strategies that is going to be more beneficial than single strategies as well. So I think that remains to be seen. Uh, but I would say that for now, it's great that there's so much interest and in research and having multiple modalities uh, coming at it is a good thing. Can't see. Questions oh, yeah. related to the exclusion criteria for seizures. Is cortical myoclonus considered seizures in your criteria for the study? So specifically cortical myoclonus, I believe, is not considered a seizure. Um, so it's uh, the seizure uh, criteria is specifically if you have uh, um, more than three, uh, I believe, uh, 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 I'll have to get back exactly, it's, it, the wording is there on timing, if they last more than a minute versus less than a minute. Um, and also you have to be stable on your seizure medications uh, or at the, at the um, judgment of your clinician who's looking at, so, uh, looking at uh, the disorder, the, uh, looking at uh, in, inclusion. But specifically, cortical myoclonus wouldn't be considered a seizure per se. So it doesn't matter if they have cortical myoclonus events daily for an hour or so, that still would not exclude them. It's only if you're looking at um, events or seizures that are actually pinned to seizures like grandma's or absent seizures or things like that. But so, so perhaps maybe we can talk offline because I'm not sure exactly because it, it, like it depends definitely individually. So uh, with, with, uh, we can definitely discuss and especially with your site uh, uh, investigator as well. Okay. Thank you. Sure. There's like bright lights in my head, so I can't see. Is there any more? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Time for one more? Okay, great. And then this will be the last question, but Ovid's going to be here all weekend, and they have a booth outside, so they're going to be they're so accommodating and so open to questions, so no one's questions will be left unanswered. Yeah, so while you're getting the questions, so yeah, so we'll be outside. We actually have a little sign-up sheet outside if you want to spend some time speaking to uh, one of us or one of our um, uh, folks uh, who are part of the trial. Feel free to meet us at the booths, but yeah, go ahead. Simple question. Uh, for those individuals with Angelman syndrome who can walk with a walker but not independently, can they be enrolled in the trial? So, so we did specify that as long as you are consistent with your walking, we, you should be able to be enrolled in the trial. So even if it was holding a one hand, as long as you're doing it the same way, both, both at the baseline as well as end visit, 
uh, we had allowed that. Great. Well, thank you very much uh, from Ovid and the family at Ovid to you. Uh, we'll see you uh, the rest of the weekend.